for this evening we're going to take a look in the prophet Hosea and chapter 7 story of Israel being dragged down by the other nations we're going to just read from verses 8 to 16 Ephraim another word for the northern kingdom of Israel Ephraim mixes with the nations Ephraim is a flat loaf not turned over foreigners sap his strength but he doesn't realize it his hair is sprinkled with gray but he doesn't notice Israel's arrogance testifies against him but despite all this he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him Ephraim is like a dove easily deceived and senseless now calling to Egypt now turning to Assyria when they go I will throw my net over them I will pull them down like birds in the sky when I hear them flocking together, I will catch them. Woe to them because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them, but they speak about me falsely. They do not cry out to me from their hearts, but wail on their beds. They slash themselves, appealing to their gods for grain and new wine, but they turn away from me. I trained them and strengthened their arms but they plot evil against me. They do not turn to the Most High. They are like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this, they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Not on balance, a very cheerful message there. A call from God to repent, as is the whole uh, book of Hosea. It's remarkable that when Hosea married his wife Gomer, he knew she was going to be unfaithful to him. It's even more remarkable that God set his love upon his chosen people Israel when God knew in advance all the ways they were going to be unfaithful to him. They'd worship false gods, making idols for themselves like the golden calf, bowing down to the Baals and Asher, the fertility gods of the surrounding pagan nations. Instead of putting their trust in God, Israel would form political alliances with other nations. They'd reject God's laws, desecrate his temple, pollute his Sabbaths. Yet God kept on loving the Israelites. For almost a thousand years since Moses, God had kept on loving his chosen people. From time to time, he would call his people back to himself through good kings, through the priests, through his messengers, prophets like Elijah, Elisha, now Hosea. And here in Hosea chapter 7, God is still calling his people to repent, to return to him. And he uses four very memorable pictures to illustrate the sins of Israel. These pictures can act as warnings for Christians as they show us the kind of sins even believers can fall into today. And the first one was there uh, in verse uh, 7. Ephraim is a flat loaf, not turned over. Uh, the problem of partial holiness when you're cooking bread in a pan rather than in the oven the way they used to cook it um, if you don't turn over the bread halfway through uh, it ends up only half cooked the perennial problem that Mary Berry would call the soggy bottom uh, Israel is a worse as as worthless as a half-baked cake uh, foreigners sap his strength but he does not realize it Two problems, worshipping foreign gods, also making alliance with pagan nations. And both of these were draining the life out of Israel because they were relying on other nations instead of relying on the one true God. One commentator wrote, how better to describe a half-fed people, a half-cultured society, a half-lived religion, a half-hearted policy than as half-baked loaf, inedible because it's burnt on one side, raw on the other. God demands wholehearted obedience, not partial holiness. His chosen people should belong to him alone. God commanded this time and time again in the law of Moses, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy as I am holy. In his farewell speech, Moses had warned the Israelites of the dangers of compromise. He'd set a stark choice before them. Deuteronomy 30 verse 
15, see I set before you today, life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you're entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing to Jordan to enter and possess. Moses had warned Israel. The command's clear to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind. We've seen this call to stand out from the crowd, to be different, repeated many times in the New Testament. To be set apart holy as God is holy. When we were looking in 1 Peter chapter 2, you were a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So Peter goes on, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul, live such good lives among the pagans, that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits you. People should be seeing the difference that Jesus makes in our lives, in our speech, in our lifestyle, in our love. In Hosea's time, Israel was led aside by fertility idols today, Many Christians are distracted by all the false gods of money and entertainment and celebrity and the lure of a nice, comfortable, easy life just fitting in with the world. How tempting it can be to be a little bit holy, but not too holy. But if that's the case, we become as unpalatable to God as the half burned, half raw, half baked loaf. The problem of partial holiness. But then there's a second picture in uh, verse 9, one that uh, spikes me, uh, hits me very hard as the years have gone by. The problem of spiritual decline evidenced by grey hairs here and there. Verse 9, his hair is sprinkled with grey, but he doesn't notice. New Living Translation. Uh, says of Israel, their hair is grey, but they don't realise they're old and weak. I'm not sure that I agree that grey hair means old and weak, but still, good news translation, their days are numbered, but they don't even know it. If the Israelites had turned away from God suddenly, dramatically, they'd probably have realised the mess they were in. But here's the danger with unfaithfulness, adultery. It takes something which is pure, then little by little pollutes it and destroys it. That which was pure is spoiled, it is adulterated. And that's what had happened to Israel, one act of worshipping false gods here, then another, then the political alliance, turning into temple prostitution. And the Israelites' faith in the living God was polluted, but so slowly and gradually they didn't even notice it was happening. Their hairs turned metaphorically grey as their vitality was sapped away and they didn't realize it and that's the way that christians usually drift away from god not in one big obvious sin not in one dramatic fall but in a slow imperceptible decline a little stumble here letting standards slip there skipping a worship service then another next month and then being too busy for a prayer meeting or home group or christian service and slow decline turns into apathy I think that is a picture of how some Christians have drifted during the COVID lockdowns and now struggling to return to church and to fellowship. It is so difficult to stay close to God, too easy to become spiritually flabby without even noticing. And I think churches can fall into the same trap, a picture of how some co corners of the church have been declining for decades. Uh, one little compromise here, one disregard of clear bible teaching there on particular issues accommodating themselves to the views of the world around the slippery slope of spiritual decline gray hairs here and there they don't even know it
there was a solemn warning in Revelation 3 to the angel of the church in Sardis writes, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds and finished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and learned. Hold it fast, repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. A church resting on its laurels, becoming complacent about holiness and prayer and evangelism. A church which didn't care about biblical truth and sound doctrine can so easily follow Israel into spiritual decline. There is hope for us all, however many, however few grey hairs we may have, we can always return to God. But there's also a solemn warning for us here in verse 10. Israel's arrogance testifies against him, but despite all this, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. Israel had become so comfortable in their spiritual adultery that the whole nation had passed the point of no return. Judgment was going to be coming. Grey hairs here and there. Then there's another picture, uh, an amusing one this time for bird watchers, particularly Israel. The silly pigeon. Uh, Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless, now calling to Egypt, now turning to Assyria. And when they go, I'll throw my net over them. I'll pull them down like the birds in the sky. When I hear them flocking together, I will catch them. The silly pigeon, the problem of wavering loyalties. Uh, New Living Translation says, silly witless doves. Um, the message often very entertaining, bird-brained, mindless, clueless, is how Eugene Peterson describes Israel. The silly pigeon, God should be their help and strength because it was God who brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea, safely on dry land. It was God who'd given them the victory as they took possession of the promised land. Egypt could never save Israel. Assyria could never save Israel. Only the Almighty God would be able to rescue them from their enemies. But instead, the Israelites kept wavering from one political alliance to another. God would be their strength and refuge, their ever-present help in times of trouble. But instead of putting their trust in God, they were just flitting around. It's a challenge for Christians. If we face problems, do we turn to God first or last or not at all? When we have problems with our health or with neighbours or in our family, money problems, fear about the future. Do we turn to God? Do we depend on God? Too often Christians struggle with problems by ourselves or turn there and everywhere for, for solutions or for help instead of looking to God for help. Israel was turning every way except back to God. They were silly pigeons. Partial holiness, spiritual decline, wavering loyalties, and those problems had inevitable consequences for the Israelites, expressed in the fourth picture in verse 16 there. They do not turn to the Most High. They are like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this, they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Israel, the faulty bow because they were refusing to put their trust in God. His chosen people of Israel had become as unreliable, as useless, as ineffective, as a crooked bow, which always missed the target. When it came to fulfilling God's purposes and bringing glory to God, Israel were not a help, but a hindrance. More useless than a faulty bow, which doesn't only miss its target, even risks injuring other people, recoiling, killing the user, causing more damage than the enemy could. God's people had strayed from him and rebelled against him. And it wasn't just that they were missing out on the blessings God longed to pour down upon them. Israel were also no longer able to fulfill God's purposes for them. They couldn't fulfill their destiny as a holy nation and a royal priesthood. So God's honor was insulted. His glory was tarnished in the eyes of the world. God's people had become a half-baked loaf with grey hairs but they didn't know it they were a silly pigeon they were a crooked bow they were 
worse than useless to God. Like any Christians who've lost their way and become spiritually weak and powerless, like any believers whose enthusiasm and commitment flip from one thing to another, but never to the things of God. Like it, so many churches which see discipleship and holiness and evangelism as optional extras, like too many churches now changing their beliefs to fit in with what the world around says. They've become faulty bows, crooked bows, no use in God's purposes. No longer a strength, but a liability in God's continuing mission to redeem the world. They're missing the target. And these stories of the warnings uh, to Israel are warnings of sins for us to avoid. Remember, uh, uh, Paul wrote this to, to the Corinthians about the sins the Israelites fell into in the Old Testament. Uh, the message puts it this way. These are all warning markers, danger in our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They're at the beginning, we're at the end. We're just as capable of all messing up as they were. Don't be naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. Warnings from the past, the half-baked loaf, grey hairs here and there, the silly pigeon, the, the crooked bow. May we never become complacent. May we never make the mistake of saying, we'd never do that. Let's respond to God in prayer together. Indeed, Lord, help us to learn from the lessons of the past. As Israel drifted away from you, one grey hair at a time, may we always be seeking to draw closer to you. May our loyalties not waver and flit around like Israel's loyalties. May we not be satisfied with partial holiness. May we never turn into faulty bows that are no use to achieve your purposes. Help us to learn these lessons. Help us to draw close to you, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs>